I want to talk about some of the numbers uh, that Stephanie talked about, uh, and also a word. Whoops, um, I'll stand back. I guess uh, a word that Jacob used: discretion. Uh, obviously, these these numbers, the uh, this disparities that exist play a role in the criminal justice system. And Robert talked about the rate of incarceration for people of color in this state. It's about 10% uh, rate of incarceration compared to about 2% of the general population. And that 10% number has been pretty consistent uh, the last six or seven years, maybe even more. Um, but it's, yeah, it's maybe 10, 9%. And so what happens at the roadside has a direct impact on what cases get brought into the criminal justice system. And then you get to the word of discretion. Uh, I'm a big believer in discretion in the criminal justice system because I wouldn't be doing the job otherwise. I would never do a job that I had to look at uh, a guideline and tell me what I can do and can't do. But it's a double-edged sword because the criminal justice system is made up of people. And I think the first thing you have to do is look at the people who make up the criminal justice system. It's guys like me white guys from Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and you cannot discount that when we talk about this issue uh, because we all come to the table with our uh, biases. I don't care what anybody says, you do. Uh, everybody in this room does. And how that plays out uh, from a prosecutorial perspective uh, is incredibly important because the prosecutor has enormous power in the criminal justice system. You have the power to charge, the absolute power to charge, to bring somebody into the system. Let's not even talk about the conviction. It's the charge that really carries these collateral consequences that we talk so much about that I'd like to address a little bit in this. It's the power to recommend a sentence to the judge it's the power to enter into a plea agreement. It, it really is um, an incredibly awesome power that you have control over another person's uh, life. And when you're looking at it through the lens of a prosecutor, you have to start talking about the words of empathy and compassion. And as I said, I grew up here, I grew up in Burlington. And if a young person came in front of the court who was from this area, uh, who did something that I did uh, when I was growing up, I immediately recognize that, I immediately have compassion, I immediately have empathy for that young person, and because of the power that's invested in me, I can make a decision that's gonna affect that young person's life for, for the better. I can decline to charge, I can offer a plea agreement, I can send them to diversion. But what happens when it's a person who I have nothing in common with? That's, that's where the disparities come in, when we start talking about the sentencing, when we start talking about the plea agreements, when we, talk, we start talking about the charging decision and this concept of implicit bias, when you're not even looking at the person but you're reading the paperwork and you're looking at names and you start drawing inferences from what somebody's name is. The decision to charge a felony, not to, or, or, or to charge a misdemeanor, the, the decision to seek bail or not to seek bail. All these factors is within the bailiwick and the jurisdiction of the prosecutor. And so I think part of this problem is that is what drives the inconsistencies in our system. Um, I had, I think, one of the uh, best formative, formative experiences of, of my career when I started working as a prosecutor. I worked in Philadelphia, and I worked in a place uh, in North Philly at 17th and Montgomery. I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with Philadelphia, but pretty rough area. And every single day, um, I would go to, when it was a police precinct, precinct, and you would do what's called probable cause hearings uh, there. And it was, it was, an incredibly poor area. There was really no businesses. It was up, it was up by Temple University. Uh, a lot of trash, a lot of debris, uh, boarded up buildings, burnt out buildings. You really had a sense of despair walking uh, to this area. And it was scary because public safety is really driven by perception. How do you feel? Do you feel safe? And almost exclusively 
every day when I was doing my job as an assistant DA, as a baby prosecutor, I was prosecuting African American men, really boys, for possession with intent to deliver crack cocaine. And the significance of that in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was, much like the federal government, it had sentencing guidelines. And depending on the weight, the threshold amount, uh, you would either get state time or county time. And the difference was big. State time was real difficult time, and people really, you really wanted to go to the county lockup as opposed to state prison. And there wasn't a lot of discretion for a young prosecutor. And every single day, I was doing this. And finally, it just kind of dawned on me that if I grew up in this neighborhood with really no hope, no sign of uh, jobs, of education, of opportunity, I might be doing the same thing. I happened to be lucky enough to grow up here, and so I was lucky enough to, my problem was I'd go drink beer in the, in the woods like everybody else did in Burlington. Uh, and when that got into the criminal justice system, because it was made up of people like me, there really was no impact. And so, really starting to understand and dig a little bit deeper about some of the barriers and challenges people are, fo are facing about how they enter into the criminal justice system. Where people live matters, the schools. Uh, I don't know if Jay Diaz is here. I don't know if he's not here. Yeah. So Jay Diaz, and Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, um, was the Legal Aid Poverty Fellow? Correct. And he wrote a great report, and it was essentially the school to prison pipeline, which we hear about across this country, but as Jay pointed out, exists in this state as well. Kids of color, two, like, two times more likely uh, to be suspended, to be expelled from school uh, than uh, people not of color. Kids with disabilities, uh, three times likely. And it's not rocket science to understand once you're suspended from school, uh, sooner or later you're gonna end up in the criminal justice system. And there's a real cost to becoming part of the criminal justice system. And so, so when we look at prosecutors, I think one of the first things we have to do is we have to make the office obviously culturally competent. But we, you can't teach everybody everything. So I think you have to go one step further, which we haven't achieved in this state, not only in prosecutor's office, but frankly, the judiciary. You have to make the office, the prosecutor's office, and the judiciary look like the community. Mm -hmm. the, Vermont, Burlington, Chittenden County is changing. We, look at the crowd here. This is different than where, when we grew up. Uh, I'm looking at Ellen Scalaro. I grew up with her daughter. It was, this is a different community than it was 30 years ago, and that's a good thing. And so our, institution, our institutions have to change uh, with that. We have to have a willingness to invest more in restorative justice to keep it out of the criminal justice system that doesn't carry all the collateral consequences that then prohibit people from getting employment, from getting housing, from getting going on to school. Uh, we have to be able to rely on science a little bit more than just the unfettered discretion of that 25-year-old prosecutor sitting at the council table. We really want to be able to judge who is a public safety risk. That's the job. We're never going to get away from that. But we really should be using science to inform us the data about who is a public safety risk rather than the arbitrariness of who is this person? Does he look like me? Do I relate to this person? Because it's not just the criminal charge we're going to go off. We're also going to look at the criminal history. And I, my thinking has really evolved on this, that because of all these external factors that we not necessarily take into account, we really have to go back and take a look at how people entered into the system in the first place. You talk to a lot of folks who've been through the criminal justice system, once you're in it, it's hard to get out. You know, and when you take away people's opportunity, it's pretty clear what they're gonna do. And we can get into the issues of mental illness, of addiction, of poverty, and how that plays, you know? And I know I see Judge Crawford and Michelle Jeunesse and David Shear here, all folks that work in this system, and they would tell you um, the demographic that make up the courts, the criminal courts, uh, at least in Chittenden County, and I think through the state of Vermont, are often the poor. Right. Uh, then add in the issue of race. So this is a complicated problem. I think we have to dig deeper to it. I think part of the solution 
is integrating systems. It's not saying the criminal justice is a standalone institution, that it is, that education, our schools matter, that early childhood education matters, that prenatal care matters, that uh, good quality uh, uh, grade schools and high schools matter, that jobs, that housing matters, uh, that police practices matter, and who makes up prosecutor's office matters because of that authority that's invested in, in each prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you, TJ.